was a good entrance I made there. Holy smokes, I almost fell. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I hope you're all doing well. Um, one Saturday morning, a uh, fellow woke up pretty early and uh, grabbed a bag he had already packed and uh, set out alone to do some rock climbing. And uh, things were going well, but he got to a, a very steep and unexpected sheer drop-off that uh, he wasn't aware was awaiting him. And as he was peering out over it, he slipped on some loose stones and began falling, but he <laughs> grabbed himself and uh, he was hanging on and he yelled out, help, is anyone up there? Can anyone help me? Nothing. So he yelled out again, help, is anyone up there? Can somebody help me? And suddenly this rather loud, thunderous voice said, yes, I'm here to help you. Who is this? It's God. What do you want me to do? Let go. And he yelled out, is anyone else up there? I guess that's a funny story, uh, and I, I guess it resonates with us because uh, we can imagine us responding the very same way to that scenario. Is anyone else up there? When, when we're dangling, when we imagine ourselves dangling from a 300-foot precipice, letting go, of course, is unthinkable. Surely somebody up there has got a more rational solution. Now, funny and cute as that may be, I hope that little story can serve as a reference point for a few things I'd uh, like to talk about. And I'm hoping that, it, I'm hoping to bring some clarity to a phrase that has perplexed me throughout my entire life. The poor in spirit. Exactly who are these people? Why do they get to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Would you pray with me, please? Eternal God, there's so much we do not understand, and yet we keep on returning. We so desperately want to understand. We want to be, find freedom from ourselves. And Lord, uh, we would just ask now that you open our hearts and our minds to the truth that you would have us hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, David, could you go? There we go. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Some of you have probably heard this expression before. It's pretty familiar when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot, and hang on. Now, as you can see from this slide, uh, it's been attributed to at least four pretty famous people. Interestingly, all of them presidents, which says something about the uh, demands of that job. And I guess like most happy little sayings we hear throughout our lives, there's certainly some wisdom in it. Uh, then again, I was thinking about this quote a lot when I was trying to put some thoughts together, and it finally occurred to me that if we filter this through my understanding of the gospel message, it's pretty sorely lacking. In fact, I think it's antithetical to what we're taught in the Bible. Now, before I get religious, I want to I want to consider this for a second. Does this look familiar to anybody? Uh, it sure does to me. I, I suspect that uh, that was taken in the 50s or 60s. In fact, that could be Cyril Stewart right there. I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure most of you, those many years ago, or it could have been just a few years ago, in gym class had to cl climb up one of those ropes. Uh, ba back when I, was a, when I was a kid, it was, uh, it was mandatory. You had at least had to try it. Of course, when you're 
gifted with a physique like mine, you'd get about, eh, that was about it. But uh, <laughs> some, <coughs> some folks, as you can see, we made it all the way up to the ceiling, very much like this. I mean, this is a, this is a gym. Uh, but, but I have some questions, and I really want you to answer these questions honestly. Um, did anyone ever get all the way up to the ceiling and then realize that you had to get back down? You did, Tammy. What, wh when you got up there, you had to ring a bell? Oh, I didn't. That, wow. They, they, oh, you had the knots. See, that's so cheating. And, oh, you did not. Okay. No, I never, I never took the knots. So it, when you got to the top, which was no small feat, you never did feel, no, I didn't either. But, and you looked down, what did that feel like? Terror, absolutely, that's a perfect word. Okay, uh, what happens to your, even if you made it to the top or not, what happens to your arms when you climb the rope? What, I mean, what does it feel like? It's shaky, it wears them out. It, it, uh, and how about your breathing? <laughs> yeah, awful. And then here's the worst part. What happens when you slide down the rope? It is the worst. Uh, and, it, and it's not just about climbing up and down ropes. Uh, it could happen to you. It's happened to me on a boat, on a construction site. Somebody yanks the right? It's awful. Skin, skin. And there's one more slide I want. Uh, that's, uh, I thought that was cute. <laughs> he did it. Uh, he did it successfully. And uh, so the point is, this whole thing about being on a rope and hanging on to it, I don't buy it. I don't think our president's ever had to take gym class because uh, uh, now, now, but let me, let me say this. The, the, uh, uh, when you get to the end of your rope tie and knot, that whole thing, I know it was articulated by well-intentioned folks, and we hear it day in and day out, uh, to give us encouragement for life's difficult moments, and, of course, we've all had them. In fact, difficult moments in this life are so common that they have their own kind of vernacular heading hanging on for dear life. And we've all done it. Any number of life's circumstances can take us to such terrifying and emotional brinks and cause us to hang on for dear life. It could be the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, Severe financial challenges, difficulties in a parent-child relationship, illness, depression, violence, divorce, the list goes on, one bit of bad news after, no after another. And of course, who am I to suggest what crises you may have been through? I only know that I've had my own, and they're not pleasant. In these trying times, though, we're not hanging on to a rope or frankly anything else in the physical realm. But the analogy of being at the end of your rope, I think, is very instructive, especially if we change one word. Hanging on to the end of yourself. Now, in the emotional and spiritual, spiritual realm, hanging on to one's self, I believe, is exactly what we're doing, and it's very bit, every bit as exhausting as hanging on to a rope or a root or a rock when we've just slipped off a 300-foot precipice. It requires every resource we can muster. It's relentless. It's debilitating. It's even humiliating, and it pushes us to the edge of panic. But like our mountain climber from that story, Hanging on is the instinctive human response because the alternative is unthinkable. In fact, when we reach the end of ourselves, what alternative even exists? Now, I was here last week when Justin uh, gave his talk about... Uh, Blessed are the hungry and 
thirsty. You go, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He had this magnificent slide with a, a photograph from the mountain where they believe the Sermon on the Mount was preached. And I found this. I, I thought this was kind of cute. Um, and uh, this will serve as a background for a little bit. Um, at the end of our proverbial ropes, at the end of our cell, or excuse me, at the end of our proverbial ropes, we can look down and maybe we'll see a jagged cliff or, as Tammy remembers, a hard gym floor. On the other hand, at the end of ourselves, we may look down and see nothing. At such a time when there's no strength remaining within ourselves, no fresh ideas, no new direction, no more books to read, no more songs to lift our spirits, no more friends to call, no more internal pep talks, no more memory verses to call up. When prayers hit the ceiling, if in fact we even have the strength to string together some words that make up a prayer, at the very last edges of ourselves, when there is no one else up there, welcome them to the kingdom of heaven. And I just got religious. The end of your rope is the beginning of God's doorstep. Now, I suppose at this point, many of you may be thinking, Tom, uh, what you just described doesn't sound much like heaven. Actually, it sounds horrible. And that's totally understandable, but I'm not quite finished. Um, you may recall that not so long ago, probably like three minutes ago, I suggested a list of life's circumstances that have the potential to take us to the end of our ropes, or more precisely, the end of ourselves. So as I bring this to, to a conclusion, I'd like to offer one more. And it's possible that this final suggestion has nothing whatsoever to do with that prior list. Then again, it could be the end result of some of those things. I've come to believe that the poor in spirit, as identified by Jesus in his very first beatitude, are not simply those among us that are critically in need of healthy food and clean water, shelter, medical assistance, education, and so many other things. Not simply those that we may call the poor. Nor do I think that going through one of those awful and difficult life's, life circumstances is necessary to be counted among the poor in spirit. You know, I think the poor in spirit are simply those among us that have come face to face with another kind of poverty, complete and utter spiritual bankruptcy. I think the poor in spirit have reached the end of themselves, encountered their, the poverty of their own souls, and had no other alternative than to fall into the arms of the Holy One. Now, this little presentation does not come with an instruction booklet. I can tell you that I've come to the end of myself on more than one occasion, but I've really never let go. Perhaps like the message from Isaiah that Andrew read, I was so thoroughly unprepared to see myself as I truly am that I mustered the strength to scurry back up that rope. Or for her, perhaps like the words of Jesus that you may recall, I perceived that a, a type of death and rebirth awaited me akin to a kernel of wheat falling into the ground. Regardless the reason, I would like to be among the poor in spirit. But I fear that I am not. I continue to laughingly perceive myself to be bright and witty and capable, but 
I'm not. In the spiritual realm, the part that finally counts, in the part that finally counts, I am completely, utterly, and desperately bankrupt. But even in my moments of confession, when God is telling me, let go, Tom, I've got you, let go, Tom, I've got you, my rational mind is crying out, does anyone else have you? You're poor in spirit. Perhaps you've met some of them. Perhaps you are one of them. And in a startling twist, let me say that I hope you are among the poor in spirit because that means you are blessed and that means you are living 